Okay, yes. Yep. Up go. next, Thank we you. have All Bay Collective. Good afternoon. I'm Claire Bonham Carter with ACOM. This is Chris Guillard with CMG Landscape Architecture, and we are honored today to be representing the Orbe Collective. Hi, team. Thank you. Thank you. Now, we came together as the Orbe Collective to collaborate through consensus for the Resilient by Design Bay Area Challenge. It has not been easy. You might remember us from the midterm presentation. <laughs> We have had difficult, complicated, emotional, humbling conversations with our community partners, but we are stronger for it, and we are so inspired by this challenge and by this community. Now, during the design process, we also collaborated with another collective, the East Oakland Collective, and now I would like to introduce to you someone who has inspired us so much. Marquita Price, who's the Urban and Regional Planning Officer for the East Oakland Collective. What's up with it? We're here in Deep East Oakland, California. Born and raised here from District 7. Um, we here in um, East Oakland are the most historically redlined and disadvantaged community in Oakland. We here, we want to thrive and not just survive, but yet the, the, the conditions of the planning processes in our area have not allowed us to do so, and so we're looking to move forward to bridge the, the wealth disparities and enhance our quality of life as we um, also simultaneously address the, the current sea level rise and combined flooding risks that we are um, facing in our in our neighborhoods. Kita laid down a challenge for us, and we embraced it. She has been an integral part of all the All Bay Collective team, alongside Colin Miller of the Oakland Climate Action Co Coalition, Greg Jackson from Repaired Nations, and Beth Tepper from Mer Merritt College. Their clear and consistent message about equity has really shaped our approach to the challenges facing the residents around San Leandro Bay. To kick off our, des our design process, our team met with agency leaders alongside our community partners. For example, with the Mayor of Oakland and with the Alameda Flood Control District, so we could better understand each other's priorities and perspectives. Our community partners joined us for our weekly design team meetings, helping us expand our focus from rising seas to issues of housing affordability, air quality, and economic development. They also introduced us to some incredible groups in East Oakland, like the kids of Brookfield Elementary, who talked to us about flooding on Earth Day and then showed us rising groundwater in the tree pits they were digging in their schoolyard, a schoolyard that backs directly onto the 880. With these groups, we played our In It Together game, which I'll tell you more about a bit later on and we heard about their concerns about healthy food and safe ways to get to school. The big model you see here of San Leandro Bay was made by the students of the California College of the Arts and became the impromptu speaking circle at our third project group working meeting. Our agency partners, the ABC team, the community, anyone who wanted to speak jumped into the bay to share their thoughts with the group. And this is RJ from Scraper Bikes, who's working al alongside Let's Bike Oakland. Come to the summit tomorrow, and you can jump into the bay yourself. <laughs> or rather, jump into the estuary, as residents call it. When we met with Oakland Mayor Libby Schaff, she said, San Leandro Bay? Where's that? Oh, I call that the estuary. Many locals told us this. Our community-based organizations were already connected at the start of the challenge, and it was through these experiences of listening and learning we, we created valuable relationships between those living and working around the estuary. They also led to the unifying framework for our proposal, the estuary commons. Now, the idea of a commons has a rich 
political, and urban history. It joins together people and places through the shared management of resources for the benefit of all. Simply put, the Estuary Commons is about people, place, and a path forward. And now, Chris wants to take you back to the kids of Brookfield Elementary School. All right, I think it's safe to say that we've all had some humbling and moving experiences as part of our work on RBD. And watching my colleague, Nico, talk with the kids at Brookfed Elementary School about sea level rise and flooding was one of those moments for me. It really gave me a new perspective, motivated me, and brought home the fact that this is truly a multi-generational challenge. And as Nico later noted, um, that the urgency is very real. Um, there are people who are already working to address decades of injustice, the housing issues, as well as uh, preparing for disasters. And for me, that's the paradox of the challenge in a lot of ways. We need to act with urgency, but we must also acknowledge the injustices of the past and the uncertainty of the future. In order to do that, we've turned a few classic ideas upside down. We're putting creeks over highways rather than under them. We're putting communities at the center of the planning process rather than in the background. And we're letting natural systems and hydrology guide infrastructure planning. There are four key moves that create the estuary commons. Catalyze wealth creation within deep east Oakland. Adapt the estuarine environment to create a working landscape that is also a civic space. Stitch the neighborhoods to the shore with new green connectors and set the stage for all communities around the estuary to prosper. These all come together and work in concert to guide both near and long-term resilience. And what I'm gonna share now is really the vision for the long-term. At the end, we'll come back and talk in more detail about the short-term strategies we've developed. So this image captures so much of the potential and the challenges within the community. This is uh, Planting Justice, which is a nonprofit uh, organization and nursery. They provide community education around agriculture, and they also have an amazing um, holistic reentry program for ex prisoners. And this is just one of many examples of the amazing things that are happening within East Oakland. But it also shows how infrastructure divides and, in many cases, pollutes the community. So, what we need to do is open up access and bring transparency to the planning processes. And we need to create new tools that will empower the community to create resilience from within. To do that, we've been exploring a series of strategies, including community benefit districts and eco-districts. And these are governance and funding strategies that can give real power to community organizations and give them the opportunity to create economic development themselves, green the community, and also address affordable housing. Now, I know that's not super specific. Um, we've, we've done some work in the background on this that I'm not able to share in detail, um, but that's one strategy that, that's come to the fore for us. Also, by boosting and supporting community land trusts, we can give communities the opportunity to stay in their homes and ease the transition to um, more waterproof housing. And resilient accessory dwelling units are another policy fund and funding tool that could be used to catalyze change in the neighborhood. These, and, and I think the key point here really is to add um, a resilient, Sorry, let me back up a little bit. To add resilience to existing policies for alternative dwelling units. Um, basically by incentivizing funding, creating awareness in the community, and um, really allowing homeowners to then retrofit their existing homes and build new units that are both resilient to earthquakes and flooding. The goal with all these strategies, again, is to allow residents to stay in their community and build wealth and to amplify the social resilience that's already in place, to bring people together through cooperative ownership and soft infrastructures. So 
We know that we need to start in the community, but we're also keenly aware that we're in the last decades of an 8,000-year period of climate stability. And that brings me to San Leandro Bay and the estuary itself. This is the existing shoreline. And as you can see, it's kind of like a hand with very skinny fingers. These fingers are already prone to flooding during high tides, but this is also a hand that can do work. The question is how we adapt and restore San Leandro Bay to create a working landscape, a landscape that's muscular, strong, and alive, a place that protects, restores, links, and gathers the communities around the bay. To do that, we first expand the existing Martin Luther King Jr. Shoreline Park and the adjacent sloughs and creeks to create additional, to provide flood protection and sea level rise protection. And let's see if I can point here. You will have noted here that there's this, uh, there's a dog leg here in what is called Damon Slough that connects to Arroyo Viejo Creek. One of the first things what we're proposing to do is to reconnect Arroyo Viejo Creek to Elmhurst Creek. That would then expand the capacity within Damon Slough and provide additional uh, flood protection. Then the, addition, the other sloughs and creeks around the estuary are also widened and stepped to, to reduce flood risk and lay the groundwork for restoration. And lastly, the park is adapted to provide sea level rise protection for one, three, and six foot increments. Together, those adaptations set the stage for habitat restoration and migration. So one of the, the most exciting ideas for restore, restoring marshlands and providing protection around the estuary came from Jan Novak with the Oakland Port when he suggested that port dredge material could be used to fill the airport channel and expand the Arrowhead Marsh. Complementing that, we've integrated migration zones into the park landscapes around the estuary to allow habitats to, and marshes to accrete and migrate with sea level rise. And together, these adaptations would provide an increase of 200 acres of wetlands above the existing 100 acres that are already there. So on our first visit to the site, the community let us know that there was a real need for safe pedestrian and bicycle connections from the neighborhood to the estuary. So we've created a network of multi-use trails that extend along the riparian corridors along with street improvements that will link the community to, a, to the estuary ring, a sinuous promenade and a series of sweeping bridges that loop around the entire bay at the center of the commons. But there's another part of this place, and it's that the community doesn't have access to open space and recreational opportunities. By activating the park in three nodes, we can create a regional destination that will gather the communities around the bay. This comes together in a diversity of experiences that allow people to connect with the land in the bay, exercise and play, socialize, and celebrate. Here on the east side, you can see how the marshes, uplands, a vibrant social space with water access come together. This is a living and working landscape. So tell me, how can I get there? And importantly, how can we change this to something more like this? Many of you are familiar with the three transportation corridors that divide the site. They're all subject to sea level rise and fluvial flooding. And while we could protect them in place with rigid infrastructures that would further divide the community and ecosystems, we can also leverage in transportation investments to remove barriers and stitch the neighborhood together. As part of a long-term vision, we propose to realign 880 and a tunnel that would run parallel to the Capitol Corridor and BART lines. Then, with that, that area could be rezoned, opening up, opening up opportunities for value capture and enabling connections from east to west. Here you can see how BART Amtrak, bus, and airport links could be combined in a multimodal hub 
that would anchor a mixed-use development on the Coliseum site. And we began to show how a ballpark coupled with a civic plaza, market, and, and sports shed could really form the center of that hub. Here is the BART line, the 880, the Capitol Corridor, the multimodal hub. So that all comes together, removing barriers to create a resilient corridor with pedestrian streets that link from east to west. Now, the Coliseum site is one of the largest publicly owned areas around San Francisco Bay. It represents an unparalleled opportunity for resilient and equitable development. And the question is how we can take advantage of that opportunity to create a more resilient mixed-use community that, that is pedestrian-oriented and anticipates groundwater. Building on the Coliseum specific plan, the All Bay Collective has developed a series of land use scenarios that protect existing neighborhoods, preserve and create new jobs, and transition underutilized land to new uses. But we can only do that if we address groundwater, liquefaction, and contaminated soils. We could retreat or build levees and put pumps in place or instead, we could move forward with tidal cities, which envisions a dynamic tidal landscape that combines ponds with mixed-use neighborhoods. And these neighborhoods would add, would be, a, excuse me, would be an adaptable, would be adaptable to sea level rise and groundwater, resilient and resilient to earthquakes. This is an approach that balances cut and fill to, to create higher ground by excavating ponds. And those ponds then create an opportunity to, to, for floating houses that are connected to the shore with buildings and streets. Tidal cities would include a mix of uses and housing types along with social spaces to create a livable community. And together, they would make a really compelling place to live. Now, if we could all beam ourselves to Amsterdam, we could kick the, tire on kick the tires on floating houses. That's not new. What's new is the idea of an active landscape, a working landscape that would allow us to live with water in the future. So here's, here's a scenario that introduces tidal cities to the low-lying areas of the Alameda Golf Course, where groundwater is already high, as well as areas flanking the mixed-use development around the Coliseum site. Whoa. The arena is retained, and a ballpark is located next to a central spine that links from a multimodal hub to a new ferry terminal at the bay. The logistics uses and industrial uses west of the arena would be intensified and retained. And then this area could be transitioned to tidal cities when groundwater rises further. So this is where the design comes full circle. The catalytic strategies that we, that we introduced at the beginning can be scaled up. New and existing communities can be connected but only if we create a resilient framework that brings together mutual obligation and shared resources, a commons. Taken as a whole, the commons brings together people and place with a path forward. It identifies urgent action to create wealth in deep East Oakland. It adapts the shoreline to create a working landscape and civic space, stitches the neighborhoods to the shore with new corridors, and sets the stage for all communities around the estuary to prosper. So All Bay Collective, can I hear you? <laughs> the people, the place, the path forward. All right. With that, with that, I would like to introduce one of our community partners who's going to talk about our first step on that path. My name is Colin Miller. I'm coordinator of the Oakland Climate Action Coalition 
and I'm so excited and humbled to be partnering with 15 different East Oakland community-based organizations in the Transformative Climate Communities Planning Grant. Together, we're going to be supporting community-led, community-driven visioning and planning for what we want to see as a resilient and equitable East Oakland without displacing existing residents. Examples include supporting worker cooperatives, planting thousands of trees, building more urban gardens, community land trusts, more deeply affordable housing, and community-owned solar. Thank you, Colin. Mm -hmm. So what's next? How do we address the urgency that we've heard about? Well, Resilient by Design has great timing. Many of our stakeholders are right now working on local adaptation actions, and they want to keep working together. And we believe that the work of the East Oakland Neighborhood Initiative that Colin just talked about is foundational to achieving true community-driven resilience. And with additional funding, the community can take its rightful seat at the head of the planning table so their interests and expertise can be central going forward. And the ABC Toolkit can be used in this effort. And the Toolkit includes the In It Together game, which allows people to step into each other's shoes to explore possible resilience actions and weigh their trade-offs. It's a bit like Settlers of Catan, <laughs> but with living levees instead of sheep. This game has helped us explore tricky situations like groundwater and even retreat, and showed how teamwork and collaboration can offer the best path forward to solve real-life vulnerabilities. And so far, we've played the game with about, about 10 times with stakeholders, giving me some of my favorite moments of the challenge. Kids, adults, planning nerds alike, all get very rowdy and enthusiastic as they try to collaborate. Our next step is to train community, city, and agency representatives to be game hosts. The In It Together game is particularly effective when used alongside our community resilience investment decision-making tool. Yes, it's a mouthful, but the idea is very simple, to help residents and policymakers evaluate the trade-offs between different adaptation actions to achieve social, environmental, and governance benefits alongside economic value. The cool things about this tool, one, governance is lifted out as its own bottom line because collaboration is so central to resilience, and two, it's open source, so anyone can use it and adapt it to their goals. Now, Chris earlier described a spectrum of funding, financing, and implementation tools. And in the near term, we propose the creation of a community benefits district in East Oakland to provide an early organizational framework to catalyze reinvestment. In the coming semester, teammates from UC Berkeley and CCA are going to continue to embrace community-based learning and bring the studio to the street and the street to the studio. We also propose some near-term shoreline adapt and stitch projects that with funding could start tomorrow to move us towards the estuary commons. And this map shows some of those projects which would address today's flooding issues, fluvial flooding issues. For example, our pro proposal for Doolittle Drive and expanding the marsh into Airport Channel is a creative example of beneficial reuse of sediment. It would do two things, provide a barrier for flooding and new habitat for wildlife as sea levels rise. The near-term projects that stitch the neighborhoods to the estuary will make it safer for kids to cycle to school. The project I want to highlight is the Hegenberger Greenway. The segment of Hegenberger Road between San Leandro a Avenue and International Boulevard is the equivalent of an eight, of eight lanes. It's really oversized. And what we would do is reduce the number of lanes to provide a safe ped and bike route planted with trees to improve air quality, reduce noise pollution, and improve air quality. We also want to pro prototype tidal cities with a prefab housing developer and here's a model made by UC Berkeley students you can play with tomorrow at the summit. Because of the critical need for lower income housing in Oakland, we also want to emphasize the role that a community land trust could play as an owner of some or all of these units, making sure that the neighborhoods, the prices in these neighborhoods remain stable and affordable for decades to come. Now that was a lot and I'm running out of time. So here's a really quick recap of our path forward for you. 
the ABC Toolkit, tar targeted shoreline and adaptation projects, new bike and ped connections, and a prefab tidal city prototype. Now, Kita started our presentation wanting to thrive and not just survive. Our team has created conversations and built incredible connections where none existed before. We have the momentum to carry this forward and move towards Kita's goal through agency and community projects that are happening now and others that we could start tomorrow. Collectively, we ask you to acknowledge this hopeful beginning of a new era in city planning. Colin is here, East Bay Regional Parks are here, Bard is here, Caltrans is here, and they all are all ready to move forward. Let's fund this group to keep working together and keep the community at the heart of the conversation. We want you all, the regional agencies, the others of you in the room here today, to partner with us to keep the momentum. Let's make the Estuary Commons real. Come on, team. The rest, the rest of our partners are going to join us on the stage. We've got Sylvestrum Associates. Yes, everyone stand on the carpet. Skio, UC Berkeley, California College of the Arts, David Baker Associates, East Bay Regional Parks. Who have I missed? Come on, team. City of Alameda. Colin. Colin. Beth. Yeah. Greg. Yeah. <laughs> Come, everyone, come forward into the light. Come forward onto the carpet. Onto the carpet, everyone. Come on. Be brave. Yeah, bring it up. All right. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a bold, powerful vision that you have. My question is, to what extent does the sustained success of your project a function of what happens in contiguous areas? What happens if you're the only ones that do these things? So uh, I think if I, 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 that is an interesting aspect. Great question. It's an interesting aspect of this uh, project. A after hearing the presentations today, the, uh, one of the unique things about this site is that we have the different uh, three uh, cities, uh, different agencies. Uh, the uh, components, um, Chris, do you want to talk about how the components of the project add up to the whole? I think that would be a good way to answer the question. Well, I think one of the things that's critical is that we have been working with Alameda and the airport around the edge of the bay, at least in terms of uh, groundwater and sea level rise. Um, I think your question raises this critical question of the link between projects and the regional planning versus the sub-regional work that we've been doing. And uh, we have studied, for example, the impacts along the 880 corridor and the extent of sea level rise and how that would work relative to the intervention that we're making. And that is designed to allow for um, sea level rise of like up to 10 feet, for example. But if you continue around Alameda, you still end up with these issues. And I think that the biggest issue is on the, the two south edges of, of the site. <clears throat> Okay. <laughs> Just silence. <laughs> um, a really great presentation. I'm intrigued by um, thinking back to the midterm, um, but but for a really interesting question. So one of the things that came up is I felt um, what we were hearing from the community groups is that they felt like this was the first time, like they've been working together, but this is the first time they felt like they had a seat at the table. Um, and I'm intrigued by what the definition that was given for the comments was really around shared management of resources. So I, I get that the, the game and piece of your toolkit sort of will help everybody kind of get the information they need, but I think I would love to hear a little bit more about how is it being maintained that those groups get to keep the seat at the table that they got through the course of this process. I'll start the answer, but then maybe I'll uh, also ask uh, Colin or, or Andrew from the two uh, communities. One, 
actually, I have a microphone here. <laughs> Pass it here. One, uh, one of the specific requests that we're asking uh, to, to use some of the potential funding for is to actually fund the time for the community members to be active and participant in the process, because that's one of the things we heard over and over again, that it's just a, a practical reality of, of actually being able to be there. And, and just one other thing that I think is really inspiring is the conversation that uh, Pandora uh, from PSET and I have been having about you know, lessons learned in, in Marin City and lessons learned and, and actually uh, the connections that Claire ma mentioned that were made here, they're incredibly complementary. And I'm really excited about the potential of uh, maybe uh, our team and, and some of the connectivity that we're able to help uh, foster in East Oakland could happen in Marin. City and um, but Colin or Andrew, any thoughts from you on behalf of the communities? Colin, hey everybody. So yeah, thank you so much for your question. And yeah, it was a really intense uh, conversation for those people who were at the midterm critique. Um, and I, I think that you know in the last few months, um, the All Bay Collective team really did a good job of of seeking to incorporate a lot of the feedback and a lot of the suggestions and ideas and concerns um, of community groups. And I think it's it's fair to say that the overall kind of process and structure of Resilient by Design was not uh, inclusive or equitable in the way that it was structured because it did not involve community groups, especially groups most impacted by these, um, by these systems, by climate change, um, which as we know is, is symptomatic of, of extractive economies, right? the result of extractive economies um, and, and generations of inequities. And so I think it's, it's just important for this process, for people learning from this process going forwards, to seek to include uh, people who are most impacted by these systems at the very, very beginning. And I do appreciate All Bay Collective and the team um, for doing a, you know, a good job of listening and seeking to incorporate folks' input and feedback in the last couple of months. Um, but I think it, is, it, is, it was a structural challenge um, for the Resilient by Design process that I, I hope will be rectified um, if it's replicated elsewhere. Yeah, I was going to ask, uh, wh where do you see it? I mean, in, in, the, in the work presented, you know, the drawings and the designs, vast at times. You know, that you're, you're looking at highways, and you're looking at the, uh, yeah, the Coliseum site, and you're looking at the airport, and you're looking at all that, and I'm the community member. Do I see it in the new area around the Coliseum, the floating city there, or do I see it in the preserved area that's sort of on the map above? Where, if I'm a community member, do I see my concern? Um, I, I, if I understand your question correctly, I think it goes to the uh, adaptation uh, portion particularly, and, and I think uh, in the presentation, Chris talked about the um, the portions of work that could immediately be implemented in uh, in the Alameda, but also in the Upper Fingers in in, in Oakland. Uh, anybody else want to take a shot at answering that? So some of that I, I would say is relating to the connectivity that would be would would start soon. We've heard a lot about the need for safer access, uh, bike routes to school, pedestrian access, and routes down to the shoreline. So those are some of the things, and then air quality and um, job generation are the other two that we'll be looking to, to progress as well. And some of that, as Stephen says, comes from the adaptation around the shoreline. Um, I don't know if this is gonna turn into a question, but it's... <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's a comment, maybe. Um, I really appreciate that you have kind of pushed some norms. The, 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 particularly the freeway and the, and the transportation system alignments. Now, I don't know if those are technically possible. I think we should certainly learn more about all that. But um, throughout today, it has really struck me how the legacy of the freeways in particular in this region are really shaping the life of the region and how the transportation agencies, whether it's MTC or the local ones or the, the Caltrans, they have a p profound role here. And I wonder, like, 
maybe here's the question, since I did think of one while I was talking. Um, to what extent have these agencies acknowledged their role in creating the vulnerability in this region and their role in addressing the challenges? Well, it is uh, a, a great question, and uh, maybe I'll ask uh, Paul to think about a, a thought on this too, because one of the, the with regards to, first off, uh, Caltrans, uh, BART, uh, uh, were really great partners in, uh, and, and the airport were great partners in, in the project working groups. And one of the one of the common uh, messages we were getting that that their their long term their idea of long term planning is it's a lot of a, a focus on uh, urgent, um, just keeping up with uh, what what in the planning world you might think of as relatively short term. So improving uh, intersections or things like that. I, I think what was really exciting about this process were the relationships that were built, but also. Um, the uh, buy-in to uh, the idea of the quadruple bottom line as a, as a com common denominator where the agencies can talk to communities and, and have a transparent, uh, communicable uh, 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 tool that everybody buys into. Uh, so while we, we explored at a very high level different options for the 880 corridor, as an example, uh, the um, idea, uh, the most uh, uh, forward-looking idea of, of pulling it back into a tunnel that could have some shared benefits would, would really need to go through that cost-benefit and the community-driven process that we're proposing. Um, Paul, any thoughts on QBL? Uh, maybe not on QBL, but just, you know, real quickly, I, I think you know that MTC and some of the other regional agencies have acknowledged the historic role that these major transportation assets or uh, infrastructure play in creating vulnerabilities, particularly in low-income communities of color around the Bay. And we are just, I think, now beginning to really be proactive about addressing those historic legacies of inequity created by, um, as you said, this, this ring of transportation infrastructure that defines and limits the way that we respond to the challenges of climate change and sea level rise. So um, our partners in this process have included Caltrans, BART, um, local officials, certainly community groups, and I think that um, it's that kind of bringing together, one of our core principles from the beginning is that bringing together all of, the, all of these different entities will allow us to recognize these challenges and to address them proactively. And I'd say one, one last quick thing. The uh, long-range development planning process is uh, 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 happening in Oakland, and, and Devin with the uh, planning department reminded us that there is a chance to update the uh, transportation and for the first time in California, the environmental justice uh, components of a long range general plan. So that's exciting opportunity. And is it, I don't know how to say the question. Um, it's like the, when you look at what you come across is what actually almost every team came across is that there's a, uh, and the, the team before it, um, it worked on San Francisco, actually, you said it, it's a sandwich. Well, you know, it's a stack of sandwiches. So before you, it's like- Club sandwich. It's like, no, well, a club sandwich is like, like <laughs> the underestimates like that. Um, you, you have to fix bad planning, fix bad engagement or no engagement, uh, fix bad infrastructure, fix bad investment, fix bad economy, environment, and so forth. So before you know it, you're, you, you'll never get close because it's such a stack. So what I like about what you do is that you um, you, you use this uh, reference of the commons as a way forward. But that puts a question on the table, can this be done? Because some of the images are like, my God, that's a lot of infrastructure to protect the airport. Eh? And so all of a sudden it was this, like this, this curly, water and then the, you know you had one image where everything was water and then the next image everything was safe and <laughs> which is like nice from a magician's point of view but oh my god you know how do I ever get there eh? so um, and the idea of not focusing too much on a fragmented siloed up approach of fixing one by one by one but you know coming from the other side and saying okay 
Uh, this is the place, this is the process and the way we build a coalition and work together. But then still the question is on the table, also for you know, uh, making this work, can this be done? So can you elaborate a little bit on how are you gonna make this happen? Yeah, Claire, do you want to take a shot there? <laughs> <laughs> I've done enough talking. Who else wants yeah. to take that question? Christina? Christina, yeah. do you wanna? Can you give Christina the yeah. microphone? Yeah, there you go. I, that's obviously a super hard question, but I think it has to start in the Bay Area with governance because of our fragmented local government land use control. And I think that the proposal we're making here is a good example. A community benefit district is a pretty generic tool in California. But what a community benefit district does is it makes a nonprofit at the center of a spatial area that can collect a dollar per parcel. But it gives that nonprofit a seat at the table. There are 10 community benefit districts and business improvement districts in Oakland, none in East Oakland. So if East Oakland had one, it has a seat at the kind of informal table of governance which is based on these community benefit districts. And the secret sauce is, once you have a community benefit district, it can be coterminous with, overlap with, a geologic hazard abatement district which has power of eminent domain, which can exist permanently and which can address these soil issues that are core in our area, but also in other parts of the Bay. So I think there's an initial strategy, the Community Benefit District, that transitions into potentially a geologic hazard abatement district, and then that has incredible power. I shouldn't even say this out loud, but it can, a geologic hazard abatement district can be exempt from CEQA, from the California Environmental Quality Act. I didn't just say that. <laughs> so there is a lot of power here that we're not tapping in governance because this is a new problem and people haven't tried it before. And I just want to chip in, if I may, just one thing. We, I said there are so many other projects actually happen, happening now around this area, and we developed this incredibly strong collaboration with our regional agency, agency partners. So Alameda is doing an, a climate adaptation plan right now. The airport is already thinking about Doolittle Drive and what it should do there, along with Caltrans. We had Colin talk about their neighborhood initiative, which is a big planning effort with Oakland happening now. And I think leveraging all of that, and you know, we, we had this ask, we want to keep this going. We have the momentum to keep it going. We have all committed, I think all of the groups here, to continue working with the community, all the communities, not just East Oakland, but in Alameda and San Leandro to keep this momentum going. So obviously there's a lot of money that's needed for the big stuff, but I think the small incremental projects could start tomorrow. Yeah, sure, Colin, let's add something. Thank you all. Just to build on what you all were saying as well, I just wanted to let folks know that um, in terms of the transformative climate communities uh, funding that, that Claire just spoke about and was in the, in the presentation as well, uh, that really is, I think, the very best California climate investment program uh, out there right now. And uh, Governor Brown is about to slash that funding in his proposed budget. Um, so we're doing some, some advocacy right now um, to, to try to protect that funding and move it from his proposed $25 million to at least $100 million. Um, but that, that funding is, is definitely on the chopping block uh, from Governor Brown's perspective. Um, and so please reach out if you, if you can support in any way, if you have any connections or would like to be involved in supporting that effort to make sure that uh, that public funding for holistic and community-driven um, climate resilience and adaptation funding um, that really puts uh, low-income communities and communities of color at the center of the planning and visioning process um, please, please reach out and let me know. Thank you. We're getting a one minute signal. Is there a quick question? <laughs> well, I, I had a similar thought as, as earlier um, that I think it's really important with these types of projects that we are now discussing that we are not repeating the, the dinosaur infrastructure uh, projects of the past, but we are moving to more, uh, a more firmable and a sort of uh, micro um, uh, infrastructure approach. And I'm, I'm wondering how much, um, how much of your project is depending on 
uh, putting the highway into this tunnel? And what if that does not happen? And what if you can't get these bigger parts of the project realized? Um, what is then uh, left of the project? Uh, we, well, we did study all uh, uh, different causeway or uh, in, a, in a sort of a, a cut uh, situation. So there's, I think that there, the, the vision uh, definitely survives if, if that has to stay there. But it's, like I said before, we want to do a, a thorough cost-benefit analysis. There's going to be a lot of technology change during that period of time as well. Um, we think that's uh, very viable. We did some uh, parametric looks at it early on, and, and the, the, re the other parts of the vision still contain. But I think the greatest opportunity is to uh, create a, 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 a human-scale fabric that side of the uh, BART corridor. Uh, if you continue to have the way the way it is, it, it definitely compromises the the uh, the scale and the flexibility of that neighborhood. Plus, as was discussed, if we do traditional development east of the bay, you're going to have to deal with uh, uh, the rising groundwater flooding. So um, that that's the real challenge. So I really believe that if if we don't uh, figure out a way to get it get it out and behind, that you actually are gonna, may may have to actually vacate large portions of the land unless we really get creative. I would just add that all of the layers of the project really are viable without that relocation or realignment. So we're really starting in the community um, there first, um, working on connectivity, working on near-term flood risk in the stream channels. The shore adaptations and restoration work could all move forward incrementally over time to adapt that edge and provide sea level rise protection. And then again, the strategies around groundwater are there, and tidal cities could be piloted in the near term and implemented in these low-lying areas. So the, the other layers are all work um, independent from that big move. One quick thing, we were out there at King Tides, and 880 is within about a foot of the water surface. So something's going to happen to 880. <laughs> OK, thank you. <laughs> Okay, thanks everyone. We are going to take a short break so we can get back on track for timing. So we are going to start the next presentation at 345 sharp. So that means you need to be sitting down before 345. And uh, the jurors especially. And uh, Marika, do they need, do people need to get mic'd or they know? Or they're, uh, okay. Thank you. 